what is a veteran? One who served. Especially one who has fought in a war. Both at home and abroad. A man or a woman of sacrifice and service to their country. By a choice of their own or by the choice of another. Away from home in the depths of uncertainty, they serve. By the sides of their brothers, in the face of evil, amongst an entire generation, they served. They served because they wanted to. They served because they had to. Because it was the right thing to do. They served because freedom mattered. They did their job. They followed orders. They woke and slept and came and went and pushed the limits. They played their roles on center stage and far back behind the scenes. With strength of character, with nervous knees, and with steadiness of mind and heart. They served, not to be called hero, or to be lifted to its status. They served for their country, their families, for us, for our lives today, tomorrow, and forever. For their service, we thank them. high school in my senior year after I turned 18 I had to register for the draft like everyone else so that's how I ended up getting in the Navy where all my other, all the other fellows were drafted and they went right into the army. I got involved in the war by, by joining up when I was 18 I enlisted in September 2nd, 1940. Enlisted in the U.S. Air Corps for three years. So I walked up Main Street and uh, they were tacking up a sign, Bask in the Florida Suns. I looked and I thought, that's for me. And uh, I went in and uh, they sat me down and took me a cup, gave me a cup of coffee and took my picture and talked to me and they talked me into told me about the Coast Guard, and I thought, that's for me. So I signed up and I was in. I had to go to, for a physical, and I was only one out of eight that passed. 17, and I was in, a senior in high school, and I figured, why don't we join the Air Corps, and then we can learn to fly. I was drafted. I was drafted, and then I had basic training, it was supposed to be 13 weeks. I had nine weeks of basic training, and I got shipped out. I was working in the telephone, Southern New England Telephone Company of Hartford, when a call came in from, Chicago, from San Francisco that war was uh, ending eminently, and they needed help badly for the returning soldiers. Uncle Sam wanted me. You know, that little letter they sent you? Well, they sent me one too, so. And I registered, and I wasn't too long after. I was drafted in May of 1943, just out of high school. They shipped us to Fort Devens, New York, New, New Massachusetts. And we stayed there several weeks, and they put us on a train, and we went to California. Well, I have a brother and a sister in there. They're both Navy people. My sister was a nurse. My husband was in the service. He was in Georgia. I went down and I got a job. And I, I worked there for maybe two and a half, three years while he was in the service. My involvement in the Korean War came on January 6, 1951, when I enlisted in the United States Air Force for four years. I had seen newsreel accounts of American troops fighting and dying in Korea and felt solidarity with these men. I had four brothers in the Second World War 
one brother in the Korean War. So we were well represented. When I finished boot camp, you know, you were, I was uh, trying to be an aviation mechanic. And I saw these fellows working in the clean office in front. I said, what are they doing there? They, they're not getting dirty like this. <laughs> so I visited them and I found out that they were, well, you would call them weather people. And that's how I got into meteorology, so to speak. I was, I was a tank owner. I was a member of a tank. We, we, we practiced it. We were firing uh, at targets and things like that. So we'd be able to be able to, when we get in action, we'd be able to, 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 to know what to do. So when I, I was in my last year of high school, and we used to sell stamps, that was my effort. And, and of course, making care packages for my brothers, and uh, writing letters, I wrote a lot of letters. And I spent six months as an infantryman in Fort Devens before the Air Force got me out. They made me an aircraft engine ins inspector. So I joined, the I joined the Air Inspector's office. We inspected all the bases up and down the East Coast during, during the first part of the war. We, we, my job was to check the maintenance job we were doing on the aircraft. I had to cook them from breakfast and I had to cook you know, lunch in, in great big pots because of all the Coast Guard guards and yeah, it was a new experience for me, but I did very well. I had to wait until I was 18 before I could go in. It was a whole mess of us. We all got fellows that were in, in, you know, in this unit going into the Air Corps. I figured I'd like to be an aircraft mechanic. And uh, they gave us our clothes and all that, so to get us to go overseas. And, and I tell you, when you're going, you get khakis, you're going to the Pacific. If you get wool, you go to, the, to Europe three or four days after that, you got shipped out to Europe. We were assigned uh, hours uh, 12 to uh, 10, 12 at noon to 10 at night, Seven, six days a week. No. No, no time off because they, the boys were coming in at that time. We stayed for 10 months. Uh, uh, my friends stayed longer, but I wanted to get home. I was, I was homesick. After basic training at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, I was assigned to electronics school in Biloxi, Mississippi, where I trained to be a radar systems mechanic. This led to assignment in the 5th A&E Squadron in Fairfield, California. And we all had to stand up on a ship outside in our whites. There, you know, we really like <laughs> Our captain didn't know much more than we did, so everybody else out there watching laughing. <laughs> Nobody did that with them small boats like that. You know. Well, then we proceeded across the islands. Here to there, to... went on a lot of different islands. A lot of we just delivered stuff. Because things looked bad in Europe, they put us in the infantry, a whole bunch of us. From there, we got on a, a ship, the Ile de France, big ship. And so, <laughs> as soon as it moved from the wharf, I got seasick. That's how bad I get it. So we landed in Firth of Clyde in uh, Scotland and took a train right down to south southern England. Got on a boat and shipped us to France. The invasion was over, that was in June, so it was pretty safe. They shipped us to southern France and we joined the third division and they put me into what they call a, a cannon company. We had three artillery pieces short artillery pieces. They were 105 howitzers. Oh, three to four inches in diameter, okay? 
and we supported the infantry, which were a few miles from us. As I said, I worked on the base too. I worked with the firemen, and they were very interesting. And uh, I stayed busy with them, and we uh, well, we talked about different things, and we, you know. I was the only lady, and they were all men, so I had a good time. <laughs> Being away from home, that was, that was rough. And they were being bombed, and we'd get these letters that would be all cut out. I forgot what they call them. And you couldn't read because they didn't want you to know where they were. And, uh, you know, it was very hard on my parents. And, uh, but anyhow, they, thankfully, they all came home alive. All my work was done behind the lines, so I didn't have to worry about getting shot. Well, a few times we, st were, we landed in different isolated places or still was under, under fire, but we never got that close. We did our work and then we got out of there. Well, we had one new one that came in that um, we ran out of, we ran out of um, potatoes. So I decided we'd have, and you can have your choice, cooked rice or, or a potato, one or the other. And uh, the girl that was serving said that when, when a new fellow wouldn't listen to her. He would make up his, he, he wanted both. He couldn't convince him. So I said to her, well, let me try. So I went up there and I said, you can, I'm excited to him how we run short, and you can have one or the other. And he said he couldn't convince him. So, so finally I took the potato and I threw it at him. And then I ran. And from France we got on the train and going, to, going towards Germany, we went all the way through France. We went from the coast of France up to close to Paris, because all trains went to Paris, you know. We were given, uh, because of the MPs, they were coming home. We took and went in and took over their work. Because when we got there, it was June 16th. The bodies were still there on the beach. The bodies that you would never could identify who the hell they were, you know. And then we, we got on we got on trucks. We were going down the road and the truck in front of us got hit with an artillery shell. They overran us and, uh, and we took all of, like our guns, we took the bottoms out, the clips and threw them away. The guards that were on that was taking charge of us, they were watching us. They all, had, they all had machine guns. He says, he spoke up and he says, I'm gonna tell you, don't try to escape. Because if you do, you see that weather vane up on that? And he took out a louver and he ding, just like that. He spun it around, he, he shot it. He says, you'll be free. You're gonna, you guys are gonna be free tomorrow. I was in the engine room and that was a tough place sometimes because going through the Panama Canal, if you were on duty, <laughs> you had to sneak up, watch, see what's happening, you know. My brother was in a service, he was in the Navy, and uh, uh, he was on a, a ship, on a boat, and he fell in the water. They couldn't find him for a long time. Some of my parents were worried already because he's gone. But finally at the end they found him. He was still alive, swimming around somewhere, yeah. The challenge at that time was, uh, there was fear some days, apprehension, you know. Because you're in a war zone, I spent six months out of three years in a war zone. So one day in a war zone is a enough to make you apprehension and you think about it, you know, it could happen to any, anybody. If there was 15 ships sailing 
and a convoy to go somewhere. There was 15 weathermen on each ship. So it didn't make, really, didn't make sense to me or anybody else. So they offered me uh, another rating, what they call a quartermaster. That would be doing a strictly a seagoing rate. And I was waiting there for it to be reassigned to another ship. But it never happened. They dropped the A-bomb and that was the end of it. Every, every, young, every young, young fellow should, should have a couple of years of experience in, in the service to help them grow up, mature properly, and have respect for others. Then my youngest brother got into the Korean War, and he was, he was in the Army. But he got to see Marilyn Monroe, so that wasn't too bad. There was always a, a lot of their friends coming over. So there was, you know, plenty going on all the time. That's how I used to teach them to dance, how to dance. And, uh, you know, so they could go out on dates. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I always had a lot of boys around. That was the upside. But all I remember is flying in a P-47. I still, I, mean, I still remember that flying. That was that was probably the most exciting moment of my life. <laughs> when we left for out of New York, the Liberty Statue of Liberty was was turned off. No lights on it or nothing. But when we came back, Statue of Liberty, she was all lit up. We got as far as uh, oh, uh, Iowa when the train needed water and we pulled off to a siding to get the water and while we were there Japan surrendered and they opened up the car with all the servicemen and we celebrated and did we celebrate they had champagne and everything because those boys were so happy they knew they weren't going to have to go into Japan to fight. The best thing was when we were headed for Japan and they dropped the bomb. Oh, that was the happiest day of our life. Because we had the plans now how what was supposed to be happening. Millions of guys were gonna get killed. Because the Japanese, they just didn't quit. They just didn't quit. We did what we had to do and just to get away with. When the war ended, of course, north of us was the Battle of Bulge, and they were going through hell, and we didn't experience any of that because we were, we were miles away from them. They shipped us to uh, Brussels, Belgium, and I didn't have enough time, service time, to be shipped back home. So I was in the ration company getting food for the troops and we would make a trip to Brussels. We were several miles from Brussels camping out or something and bring the food back to the, the, uh, the soldiers there. And uh, I met some civilians there and they were very nice people, beautiful girls, no hanky-panky. I guess. I would serve out the rest of my enlistment until January 5, 1955, when I was discharged with the rank of Staff Sergeant. To sum it up, I am reconciled to the fact that I played a small part in a mostly forgotten war, Korea, and an equally small part in the Cold War. And another thing, it was a great experience because I had a chance to see the Great Pyramids, see the Sphinx. I rode a camel around the ground there, and we also, while we're in Egypt, we also had a, a fun game. We played donkey baseball. So you're just waiting for the war to get over and get, get back home. That's the main thing. <laughs>